an ESPN post comparing Dame and Giannis to Murray and Jokic, has its two top light comments utterly disrespecting Denver. Head over to Twitter, and you'll find Murray being labeled as the most overrated player in the league. Check the latest NBA title odds, and you'll find the reigning champs down at number 4 according to Vegas. It's clear a lot of people don't want to see the Nuggets back in the finals next year, and that they're still being overlooked. Stay tuned for the head-scratching reasons as to why that is. But 82.9% of you watching right now are not subscribed, so help that percentage get lower, splash thumbs up from deep, and follow the boy on Instagram and Twitter at DFlowHoops. While they won the chip in convincing fashion, Denver hasn't come close to being the main storyline in the world of sports. And look, I get Coach Prime is him and that Colorado's a football state, but especially with the condition of the Broncos, you'd assume the hype would be at a higher level than it currently is for the state's lone NBA team. Thing is, the Nuggets are thought of by many in the basketball universe as a villain. The only topic Joker has been in the media for over the past month is something that took place around two years ago, his hit from behind on Markeith Morris. This fight took place in early November of 2021, but just two weeks ago on the Matt Barnes, Stephen Jackson, All the Smoke podcast, Morris called Joker's hit a sucker shot, going on to say, he's gonna get his own though, don't trip. Jokic's wind-up foul and ejection a few months before that already impacted his public image, and two years after that, his shove on flopping Suns owner Matt Ishbia this past spring didn't help. Going back to the Morris incident, and I know it was over-aggressive from Jokic, but Markeith wouldn't have gotten hurt if he didn't recklessly charge into a 284-pound beast to initiate the entire thing. Most operate under the narrative that Jokic socked Morris out of nowhere. In terms of the wind-up ejection, Jokic would apologize to Payne before even leaving the court while being ejected. He would also make amends with Ishbia. Morris is still salty, on the other hand, and to each their own. But I'm of the mindset that your average NBA fan should cut Serbian Superman a break for getting lost in the sauce and showing his human side. I mean, he made up for his previous mistakes with an all-time great playoff run on the way to world championship title number one. That said, Joker's going to want to do everything in his power to avoid those over-aggressive lash-outs from this point forward. But Jokic's few and far between mistakes have seeped into the subliminal bias of too many people. Skeptics need to let those moments slide and appreciate the beastliness he can inflict between the four lines. Joker's had rough moments like anyone else, but that shouldn't make or break his overall legacy or the amount of respect that he gets. There's no excuse for one of, if not the greatest playoff run of all time from a should-be three-time MVP in Jokic not getting national let alone local, hype. Just because he's a horse racing phenom in Serbia as opposed to spending his off-season in America, just because he doesn't have an active Instagram account, it doesn't mean we shouldn't be finding ways to appreciate the hooping brilliance from him. Speaking of the gram, follow the boy on there at Hoops. Unfortunate part about the disrespect for Denver is that we should be talking about Jokic's post-scoring obliteration and the effect it could be having on the NBA for many years to come. Instead, the league's most influential voice in Stephen A. Smith said with a straight face during this year's finals that post-scoring wasn't a part of Jokic's game. Yikes. Given Denver's playbook, star power, and depth are all first class, we've respected Jokic and the Nuggets over the years, especially over the last few months in the aftermath of their title on this channel. However, across the NBA media, the storyline throughout the course of the offseason has been Dame Time trade rumors and Laker free agency. I know we've covered the Dame trade over the last few weeks and the Lakers did have an elite offseason, but at the same time, we shouldn't write off the reigning world champ who just took them out in four. We spoke on the lack of respect for Jokic, but you can't gloss over the lack of respect for Jamal Murray. For Jamal, it's tough to exactly pinpoint the main reason why he doesn't get widespread respect from sports fans. It could be because he still gets flack to this day about an explicit Instagram live story from over three years ago. Maybe it's because of his beef with Bones Highland. There were reports of Highland undermining Murray in the Denver Post. Murray would like a tweet reporting Highland was traded. Then, as a clipper, when Highland was asked to compare PG and Kawhi to Murray and Jokic, he refused to even mention Murray in his answer. Um, 
you know, they, they're definitely different, you know, talents. Uh, Joker is more of a, you know, passer and, you know, he does everything. But I feel like, you know, PG and them do the same thing, but it's, it's definitely different type of style, you know, PG and them are, you know, I feel like they more like scoring and uh, Joker is like a passing and then if he has to score, he has to, you know. But uh, it's going to be a great experience, you know, over here. But also, it was, it was a great experience playing with Joker as well, too. You know, there's two guys over here who was a phenomenal talent, and uh, you know, over there, was one, one guy was a phenomenal talent as well. So it's going to be a great learning curve for me, and uh, just try to pick their brain and be a sponge to everything. That said, the Instagram Live and the beef with Highland are the only reasons I can think of as to why Murray's Steph Curry-esque combination of perimeter speed and skill are glossed over. In the four games where Denver swept LA, the Kitchener, Ontario native dropped 130 points, just ridiculous bucket getting in such a short span, not to mention on one of the biggest stages. No one takes into account playoff basketball like they used to. Casuals nowadays just want to focus on stats during the regular season to make their argument. Murray needs to start being strictly judged off his handle, IQ to break down the defense, and wherewithal in terms of what to do with very little space in the playoffs. That poise allows him to both get to any spot and make heavily contested jumpers. Jamal's shiftiness is an issue for defenders to scope out. His zigzag dribbling style is what makes him elusive and reminiscent of a Jamal Crawford-Steve Nash hybrid. Combine that elusive shot creation with miraculously recovered athleticism post-ACL tear, and Murray's offensive bag blends unpredictable finesse with precision and force. Scary part is, that's not even the best part of his scoring repertoire. That'd be his shooting. Murray's averaged seven threes per night over 53 career playoff games. He's made an incredible 40.4% of those shots. Don't forget, he's not spotting up that much. Most of those shots from deep are off the bounce. Casuals labeling Murray as overrated maybe aren't aware that he became the first player in NBA history to post 20 points and 10 assists in his first four career finals games and that he's the only player next to Michael Jordan, LeBron James, and Magic Johnson to average that stat line in the finals. As a whole, from top to bottom organizationally, the Nuggets story barely gets covered by the media in comparison to a team like the Lakers. Up in the front office booth, while current GM Calvin Booth has made a ton of landscape-altering moves in a short span, moves covered in recent Nugget videos of mine, going all the way back to the end of Ujuri's tenure, when he landed a first-round pick that turned into Jamal Murray for Carmelo Anthony, then Tim Connolly taking over as GM in 2013, and that's when things really started to turn around for Denver basketball. Specifically since Nikola Jokic and Mike Malone's simultaneous rookie year in 2015, Denver steadily started building up a culture around offensive efficiency. Most importantly, both the front office and coaching staff have a clear understanding that Jokic and Murray should be taking the most shots. This understanding has meant adding by subtracting high-volume creators by trading Gary Harris to Orlando in 2021, Will Barton to Washington in 2022, and Bones Highland to LA in 2023. The system based around off-ball motion to get Jokic and Murray open looks is one in which either a veteran or young player can thrive amidst to an equal degree as long as their play styles mesh with Denver's two top dogs. The player development in Denver is first class, proven with the annual progression of homegrown products Jokic, Murray, and Porter Jr. The entirety of the Nuggets coaching staff I don't think gets enough credit for developing those draft picks. Like Jokic and Murray, also garnering a lack of positive attention are three wings who make this system tick, be an Aaron Gordon, Michael Porter Jr., and Contavious Caldwell-Pope. To put Denver up 3-1 in the finals, AG became the first Nugget, aside from Nikola and Jamal, to post 25-5-5 in a playoff game, with a mix of running back-esque line drives and prime Amari Stoudemire-type drop steps, Gordon was one of the most deadly bucket getters on the inside this year. Whether it was punishing minis by sealing off weak links then muscling it home in the half court, or merging muscle with speed in transition, Aaron's versatility made him a nightmare to stop down low. Cementing his Mile High City legacy, Aaron got mobbed in the street by hundreds directly after winning the chip. What a guy. AG would also get his official dunk of the year over Landry Shamit, iced out. A dope tribute to the baptization. I love gold! For Michael Porter Jr., 
A clip released recently of this man pulling off a 360 jelly where he took off from just inside the foul line. When you multiply that dunk contest worthy springiness with an efficient deep range shot, you see why Mike was able to post at least 20 points in 22 outings last season. Porter also added three 30-point games to his career tally of 11 in those 11 outings where he's dropped 30-plus. Among active players with at least 10 career 30-plus point games, Michael's win percentage is second best only behind splash brother Clay Thompson. This shows you how impactful Porter is to Denver's success when he gets it rolling. Going from MPJ to KCP, Contavious Caldwell Pope's only trailing Clay Thompson and Draymond Green, two four-time champions, in playoff win percentage among active players. And many are going to say KCP strictly won a chip because he was next to LeBron and Jokic. One fact alone directly proven that take dead wrong is that 2020 and 2023's playoffs, two runs that led to a championship for LA and Denver respectively, saw Contavious put up a shocking 26 games of double-figure scoring. My question is, given the world-class basketball system and talent they're equipped with, why aren't more people talking about Denver hoops after their first chip? Is it because of the reasons I stated with Jokic and Murray, or is it something else? Let me know that, plus your take on the most overlooked nugget down below, whether they were mentioned in today's video or not. This has been DFlow Hoops, and peace.